Hi, welcome to Fiber Chats. My name is Irina. I'm the host here. And my guest today is from South Africa, Sita Lagros. Hi, Sita. Hi, Irina. How are you? I'm good. Love to have you on my channel. Um, Great. So we met through Nama, Nama uh, who was on my channel as well. And she actually told me about this wonderful woman who taught her how to spin in India. And I was like, oh, please introduce me. She sounds lovely. And that's how you and I met. How did you end up in India? Well, that's a big question. Um, you know, I, I grew up, um, not where I live currently, I grew up in South Africa, but in an area where there was a, a very big Indian population. And I was always very attracted to, you know, the Indian temples and the colored fabrics and the saris. I was very exposed to that as a child. But so I never really had this deep desire really to run off to India. So I actually only ended up going to India um, when I turned 50 which is like 13 years ago or so. Um, and it was a time in my life where a lot of things came to an end, suddenly. Um, I sold my business, a relationship ended suddenly, all sorts of things happened and I was very miserable. And, you know, I just, I don't do miserable very well. I find it so boring and, uh, so basically after a week or so, I suddenly realized, well, actually I'm free. And I just had this idea, okay, I'm going to India. So I went, uh, basically within a month I was gone and I went to India. I was still very miserable at that stage. So the beginning part of my stay in India was not uh, um, very cheerful, but it was very, intense you know it was very in my face and very absorbing and it just put me into a whole different world and I was just there for six weeks and then I came back home and I decided well you know what I, I want to go and explore it more and I went back and I just kept on going and going and going every year I, you, I only have a visa for a year at a time so I would always return home for three weeks to a month, renew the visa, see my family and go back. And I really found my place there, you know, it's, uh, I live, I've lived for a long time in the mountains uh, for about the last seven years I was living in the mountains and it, the peace and oh, it's just so incredible. It's a, a face of India that not many people get to see. It's like, it just so happened that two of my best friends are South African of Indian descent. And uh -huh. so like, I know a lot about that side of uh, South Africa and the life of uh, like Indian descendant in South Africa. And they were both born in South Africa, born and raised there. So when I talk to them, when they visit India, it's like very shocking and very different from their upbringing in South Africa. Like even though the cultural background is the same, but it's not the same at all. Did you feel that? Like, did you have some preconceived notion of what India is going to be based on your experience in South African neighborhood versus what like you found there? You know, um, I, no, I didn't find it shocking. I found it fascinating and I just found it deeply touching. You know, I was in a very emotionally raw state as well for a while. And I just felt so included in everything. You know, I just, I just didn't feel like a stranger. And I, I took to it immediately. I, I do have some Indian ancestry way back, sort of three generations back. And my mother is actually from Mauritius. So on her side, and I just felt home, you know, it, it wasn't, um, no, it wasn't a shock. In fact, every time I would come home, people would ask me, don't you have a culture shock in India? And I say, no, I actually have a culture shock when I come back <laughs> to South Africa, because it's like, so empty you know the streets where are the people where's the color so i i would say india is more my home than south africa most definitely i just happen to be stuck here right now right yeah well let's let's talk about 
um, how you started because you were knitting for as long as you remember pretty much, right? I don't remember learning to knit. I just remember knitting. And in fact, I, I the first thing I actually remember knitting is my, my, my second sister was born when I was seven and I knitted her booties. So I remember that. And then um, my mother didn't teach me. My grandmother was actually a tailor and very creative woman. And I lived with her for some time. So, you know, I was always fiddling around, but mostly with cloth and pins and putting things together. But I've always knitted. And as a teenager at school, I remember I would take my knitting to school in my high school years and we would sit, uh, I, I went to a convent, we would sit on the steps and roll up our skirts to tan our legs and I would sit there and knit. So I've knitted many things, I've, I've veered away from knitting, but it always comes back and I don't not knit for, for long periods. Well, you mentioned to me that knitting wasn't part of the culture growing up, like that you were like one of the few people that you knew who knitted, that you felt like sort of strange about that what was yeah. special for you about knitting like what knitting gave you as a kid um you know I think initially I remember the first garment I made myself and um it was in the 70s and it was a tank top or like a little vest in, it was like a bumblebee. It was in bright yellow and black stripes and it had this big star on it. Now, I, I mean, I'm all about color. I love color. I've always been a very colorful dresser and I was just so like fascinated that I could actually make myself something that was fashionable because my gran and my mother and my aunts and they had done some knitting, but I mean, you know, the garments were not things that I really would have liked to wear, but I got them. Mm. So um, I made that. And then I remember making this baby doll top with something like 300 stitches um, in my teenage years. And I was just thinking the other day, I don't really know what size needles I used because there were no circular needles in those days. But I, I was fascinated about creating the textures and the textile and the color and things that I'm making things that I could wear. And then I also at quite a young age, um, I had another sister when I was 10 and I, I used to sew all our clothes as well. My mother had a sewing machine, but she was busy doing other things. So it was just, I've been, I think it runs in my genes, you know, with my grandmother as well being a tailor. And then I studied textile design after I left school and um, after traveling overseas, I immediately launched into my own business where I was silk screening the fabric and making the garments. And yeah, I, I, I loved fashion. I still do love fashion, although I'm not really fashion conscious right now, but um, I'm just excited by the process and the fact that I could actually do all these things. You know, it was fascinating to me. Well, talking about business, like you've tried all different kinds of textile businesses basically like you did the uh -huh. silk screening and then you did the felted beads and you, you sold your knitting as well was that difficult was that frustrating because handmade art is so hard to sell and so few people understand the amount of work that goes into that you know in the beginning I don't remember it being terribly frustrating. I was incredibly industrious. I used to run around to markets like mad. I mean, I've done thousands of markets in my life. And um, I just got, I got great joy from having my own business and not working for somebody, having a lot of freedom, but I'm, I'm incredibly disciplined, you know, and I love what I do. So it's not hard for me to do the work. I do find that the appreciation level from the public is they need education, you know. Um, not so much with the clothing, but with the knitting, definitely. People, we all know, you know, people think, oh, my grand can, my grandmother can knit this, I can do that. And it just takes a little bit of education with people, which, you know, and I always say, people have often said to me, why don't you have an online business with your knitwear, you know? And, and for me, that's just not an option because I would never buy something without touching it 
feeling it against my skin. And, you know, and, and as I say to my friends, if you put one of my shawls on, you will not take it off. You know, you, you feel it. It's, and I think it's also the energy, you know, that one puts into the work and there's so much joy. And yeah, I just love, I love it. I really, um, every, when I finish making something, it just hangs around in my space as I can see it. And, and I often wear the garments and, and I sell a lot of my stuff just simply from me having a little test wear as it were, you know, okay. um, but it is tough, especially in these days, these times now. When I was in India, um, I was very exposed to a, an international market as well. I took people on tours and I was around foreigners. So, and they, they have more of an appreciation. Um, in South Africa, you know, actual wool is quite difficult to get. Right. Uh, it's acrylic, you know, that's all you find. Uh, they're indie dyers and they're one or two brands, but um, people are not exposed to, and when, they, when you say wool, they think of something scratchy and you know heavy and when they touch one of the shawls I, I knit mostly in um in fingering and mohair very lightweight and they can't believe that it's actually wool and it's something that you can wear year round basically yeah. you know right. so it is tough at the moment for me right now it's very tough here but um you know, I'm, uh, I just keep doing what I do that's my motto do your thing and you know keep doing it and I'm about to actually put on a whole lot of my shawls on an exhibition in an art gallery, which is really exciting for me. Yeah. Very interesting, actually. Well, do you mm. think when people buy from you, do they buy because they like what you make or do they buy because of your personality, because they want to have what you made? Like how much of it do you think is you personally versus what you create? <laughs> well, I think probably quite a lot. Um, I'm a, a bit of a, I won't say I'm an enigma, but I'm quite an unusual kind of character in my surroundings. You know, I'm a nomad, I travel around, I'm in my 60s, I don't care, I backpack, I run my life in a very different way. And I bring a lot of color and joy to people's lives. But yeah, people are also really fascinated by the shawls themselves. And I, I knit some sweaters, but it's not my favorite thing to do you don't see these kind of items, you know, um, and it's something very new. And I find that I get a lot of word of mouth business as well. A friend of mine or somebody will buy a shawl and they'll wear it and somebody else will see it. And honestly, I have a lot of my clients. I often warn my new clients. I say, you know, there's a thing that happens with me. If you buy one shawl from me, you will end up with five or six <laughs> or seven. And that's how it seems to go, you know. <laughs> so I have really supportive friends. I really do. And, and through um, social media as well. I put myself out there. You know, I'm, I'm not, I don't love the marketing aspect, but I realize it's necessary. And because I'm not so into the social media and I don't have a website and I don't sell on Etsy, I have to work harder. But um I do. And, and that's, that's how it goes. Yeah. Well, when you need something right with the sale in mind. So to me, like, this is also like a question I ask a lot when you need to sell, do you feel like you have to need the items that's gonna definitely sell that you like no gonna sell that have certain look or like certain difficulty because like you sort of, you need to be productive. You need to make something fast, sell for more money. So you need something that's gonna look impressive but not necessarily take a lot of time. Do you even think about that when you create something or you just create first and then whoever is gonna buy it's gonna buy it? Like what's your approach to marketing in that respect? I just create. I create with color in mind and with color. About six years ago, I started dyeing uh, wool as well, um, you know, hand dyeing wool. And my idea was actually to sell the wool and I did market it for a short while, but then I realized I really just loved the wool more to work with. And the profits, there's not huge profit unless you're putting out a lot of yarn. Um, so I stopped selling the wool and I would create the colors to make the garments, the shawls, whatever it was I make. And 
Uh, I won't say I totally disrespect what people like, but actually I think I, I probably do because I go through phases of color, but I love bright colors. And I um, don't ask me to knit something in one color completely. <laughs> I, I can't, I just can't. I lose interest, it drives me mad, I get bored. And, you know, I'm also very, to me, it's a bit like painting almost, you know, I have all my, I, I decide, okay, this is the shape I want to make. And I get out a whole lot of yarn. Some of them are stashed, some are small balls. I put them out and I decide, okay, these five colors and I get started. I, I keep the rest in, in view. And nine times out of 10, I will just be knitting and I, my eye will go to my pile of stash and I suddenly change my plan. Uh, this color has to come in. And I, I change color, I change course, I change stitch. I, I do completely what I want to do. The only thing that I do kind of take into consideration, particularly with the shawls, is sizing. I love to make big shawls, but big shawls, of course, are much more expensive, take longer time. So I, I vary, you know, what I make, um, but I, I don't follow trends. Um, no, I, I have uh, an eye for color. And basically for me, it's about the color. If it's brown or gray, I can't knit with it, you know? Well, do you so, think you can ever replicate something you already knitted? Like, can you make two of the same things? It's hard. It's very hard for me, even if I have the picture, you know, or the garment that I've already made, it's very difficult for me <laughs> to replicate. I will take a style and, you know, um, repeat the same style, but I'll put a different border or I um, know it's, it's virtually impossible. And people do sometimes order from me, but, you know, I don't give them too much leeway. You know, I say, if you want a painting from somebody, you don't say put the blue here and the pink there. You know, if you tell me you like greens and purples, that's enough. I will take it from there. And they don't seem to be disappointed. So I think I get it right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. So when you went to India, you also started to spin wool, right? Spin yarn. I yeah. actually started spinning before I went to India. Okay. I, how it all started is through Instagram, I started to see pictures of uh, a Turkish spindle, you know, the Turkish drop spindle. Yep. And I was just fascinated. I love tools, you know, and I love wooden tools. And I thought, gosh, this is such a beautiful thing. And then one of our local on your, uh, online shops was selling them. And I thought, let me buy one. I'll, I'll work it out. You know, I'm like that with most things, you know, I get the stuff and then I, I do it. And then I see how you're supposed to do it. <laughs> so I got the spindle. And um, this was also about five or six years ago. And I, it was in December where we have our holidays and I was going to a friend's farm in the middle of nowhere. And I got all this fiber and I took the spindle and I decided I'm going to teach myself. Well, it was very frustrating because of course I wanted fine, you know, fine fingering. And I was just getting this lumpy, terrible looking stuff that I would never want to use. But I posted it actually and said, oh, I wonder if I'll ever be able to make anything usable. And somebody said to me, listen, this is very special. This is, we call this art yarn. And once you learn how to spin, you will never be able to make this again. So just enjoy it. So it took me a while and I learned to spin on my own. And I then took it into my daily practice as a meditation. I decided if I'm going to be good at this, I've got to do it every day. And I loved doing it. I loved the process of it. I loved the way the yarn formed on the spindle. It was just a miracle thing to me. So um, I learned here. And, um, you know, and I also took it that with the spinning, I'm not spinning to make something that's got nothing to do with it. I'm spinning to spin because it takes a long time, you know, there's the plying and everything. And uh, eventually I realized, okay, this is really, this is my meditation. I love to do it. And then eventually I would end up with enough balls to make something, but I would never give it away. You know, I would, I would keep or give to my daughter. And um, yeah, then I, then I, when I went to the mountains, I had, uh, I did a couple of workshops. I teach quite a lot of techniques as well. Um, so I had a whole lot of spindles made um, in South Africa for some workshops and I had a few over, so I just had them with me. And um, yeah, then I, I, I ended up in the mountains where Nama and I were living is, is wool heaven. Right. 
And I didn't know that, you know, when I went there, it was like the bonus that you could buy fiber, you could get pure wool, there were spinners, weavers, everything was there. So, um, and you know, there are travelers that, that spend time there and yeah, I got into teaching and that was a joy to meet Nama and you know, to have that spinning experience and then the knitting, it was really, oh, it was amazing. For me, it was the best, one of the best things that happened to me in India, <laughs> meeting well, my you, knitting. When you say that you meditate when you spin, what goes through your mind? Like what's in your head when you spin? Well, you know, when you're spinning, I don't know if you've tried drop spinning. I haven't yet, There's but I'm like very tempted. <laughs> tiny space between your hands that is where your focus is. There's lots of other things that go on. There's the spinning, there's the drafting. But the important thing is, is the space between your fingers where the twist is and the pinch. So it's a very focused practice and there's nothing else. If you start to think of anything else in that process, you lose it completely, you know, specifically if you're trying to keep your texture and a thinness. And so that in itself is a, is a, a mindfulness or a presence practice because you cannot think of anything else. So that is for me very focusing. Um, and then I also have a simple mantra that is part of my spiritual practice which just happens to go very well with, you know, the, the, um, the rhythm of the spinning. So, yeah, that's, you know, it's nothing deep, but it's definitely, it is, it is and it isn't. And for me, I also have this saying that the harder you try, you know, the more difficult things are. So don't try, just do it. Right. When you need, like, there's a lot of conversation now about the benefit of meeting, right? or benefit of like any fiber arts for this matter. And a lot of people talk about like mindfulness while you need. So like to enjoy that, not to get stress over knitting, to enjoy the texture that you create, the, the things that you create. Are you like consciously trying to be mindful of your knitting? No. No, I'm, I, I'm not a trier and I'm not consciously mindful, um, but I do find that the silence um, of the knitting practice, and I, I live in a, a very small village, we have so many birds in the garden, and I, I just kind of get lost in the, in the process of it. So I find it very relaxing, and also I, I tend to... I, I take my knitting with me absolutely everywhere, you know. So I don't get frustrated because I'm not waiting. I hate waiting for anything. And I, I tend to have to wait a bit because I'm a bit, I don't have a vehicle. So, you know, I catch a bus or this and that and I'm waiting. So I'm never waiting. I'm just knitting. So, yeah. I, and I can't watch TV or do anything without knitting, you know. And, and some people even think it's, I'm a bit rude sometimes because I take my knitting with me everywhere. But um, I just find the whole process of it very, very focused on what it is that I'm doing. And I also believe a lot that there's a lot of color therapy that goes into it as well, you know, that makes me happy. Yeah. I mean, do you consider yourself in general a patient person? Because it doesn't sound like it, like if you hate waiting. Do you think like knitting gives you patience? I, I think I have, you know, a lot of things have made me be patient I, I wasn't I'm not a nat uh, uh, naturally a patient person I don't think but I've developed patience um simply maybe well a lot also in India because you know the pace is extremely slow and you never know what's going to happen when but because I, I I don't mind you know waiting or or having to hang around because I've always got this wonderful thing that I can be doing with me so knitting probably has taught me patience. I would say it has because, you know, things take a, a quite a while to, to construct and to make, and it's not going to happen overnight. Although um, I'm a very fast knitter and I do get satisfaction from my uh, progress, but um, I, I would say, yes, it has taught me patience to a large degree. Right. Do you feel like it's sort of, an international language because you've traveled so much like you meet people through knitting just because you're knitting like it strikes conversation and suddenly you have something in common where otherwise you wouldn't 
Absolutely, definitely. I have made wonderful friends in the most strange places, train stations waiting. And I met this wonderful um, Indian lady in a train station. She's actually a retired doctor. And I was knitting a Stephen West shawl and she actually recognized you're knitting a Stephen West shawl while well, I nearly fainted, you know. <laughs> and um, so, and we've become great friends. And yeah, Pete does. People do strike up conversation, you know, a, a lot. Yes. When I was younger, it just used to strike up conversation, but not always in a very positive way. Not with knitters. People used to. I was called a granny from like age eighteen. You know. Oh, you're just knitting like a granny. But I don't get that anymore. Maybe because I am a granny. But uh, <laughs> but it does. Yes, I meet wonderful people and. Um, and you know, people who can maybe even only knit a little bit and um, get inspired, and people who've never heard of Ravelry, and I can tell them about it. And so it's lovely. It's a whole world. It's it's my world. Yes, I love it. Right. So, like, you mentioned that you like when you were learning how to spin, you just took the spindle and you like figured it out by yourself. Like, do you approach all five arts that way? Or do you have some, like, how do you learn? Like, do you have some process, like how you approach learning when something new to you? That is my process. You know, I've done many, many different creative things. Take, for example, um, there was a, a long time ago, about 25 years or more ago, I, I saw these beautiful paper mache, like frames, sort of Mexican, you know, and I was really taken with them, the color and everything. So I had a good look at them and I thought, okay, I'm going to try and make it. And I got into that. I made them these little like Day of the Dead boxes and I was even selling them. And then one day there was, I saw at the university, there was a summer school um, paper mache course. So I thought, now I'm going to learn everything that I should know about paper mache and it was like oh what I know it all you know I went there and I learned it and uh, okay fine but there was nothing that I didn't really know so I'm not scared to jump in also with when I started doing beaded jewelry I um I, I, I maybe had a book with some very basic beading in it and no I, I jump in first I try it out and then sometimes I do feel now I need to get the formal thing. And then, you know, nowadays one can look on YouTube or whatever, but, but I'm not, I'm not afraid to first try. And, um, you know, I can always learn easier tricks and things when I do study what people say or different people's experiences, it's helpful, but I'm not afraid to try. No. <laughs> How do you decide like what you're going to work on next? How do you decide between all those crafts? Because you know so many different things and you love so many different things. Well, at the moment, I'm kind of a little bit limited by my space. Because my, my main living space was actually in India. And when I came back to South Africa on my little visit and got stuck here, uh, I live in a very small, small uh, cottage and I don't have a studio per se. So everything is around me and I have to put stuff away. So I focus uh, only on knitting and spinning. Spinning is very easy, you know, to, to control. But so I'm not really, a little while back, I did get back into doing the beaded rings. I think I showed you some of those rings and I sold them all. And then I was back onto the knitting. But um no, I'm totally into the knitting and the dyeing and my daily spinning. Yeah. And, and I, I work on about four or five projects at the same time, um, just depending on the mood, what colors I'm into and how detailed. If I'm knitting lace, you know, that's a, a separate. I have to sit on my own. But I, yeah, I'm, and, and I, I like working that way because suddenly it seems that I have a whole lot of finished items at once, more or less, you know, because they're all in progress. So I enjoy doing it that way. Like, were you always that way? Because I feel like with me, something like happened to me this particular year where I used to be just a project knitter. Like I would start, I would finish. I was very proud that I didn't have any work in progress besides that one project that I worked on. Suddenly this year, I found myself jumping between the projects, putting something aside, coming back to it, making three other things, then coming back to it again. Do you feel like with you, it was always that way? Or did you come up 
at some point of your life to be comfortable with having multiple projects? I'm comfortable. I've always been comfortable having multiple projects, but I tend to not mix the craft uh, that I'm working with. So if I'm doing knitting, I'm not going to be doing um, beading at the same time. You know, if I do beading, then I stop the knitting and, and I just do the beading. But um, yeah, I think I've, I, I'm a very focused worker, you know, and, and I like to um, see progress on what I'm doing. And so I don't like to deviate too much because if I have a lot of different crafts on the go, I tend to drop some by the wayside. And if I put something down for three, four months, the chances are I'm never going to finish it. Right. You know, I, I need to go through, go right through and get to the end. And, and then I have to weave in the threads immediately and block it immediately. You know, that's how I am. <laughs> right. Well, when you went to India, was there something that you learn like culturally that was new to you and you never thought about it that way before visiting India? Well, there was something very, very interesting and beautiful that I didn't know about, which was culturally. Um, uh, probably, I can't remember how many years ago now, maybe about eight or 10 years ago, I, I came back from India and I, I um, cleared out a whole lot of my craft things, beads, all sorts of stuff that was just stashed away. I was um, decluttering my, my, my piles. And I said, that's it. I'm finished with creativity. I'm now, I'm going to India and I'm going to be spiritual. So that was my, well, my thought. So anyway, I went back to India. I didn't have anything with me, you know, craft wise. And then I, I ended up uh, going on a spiritual path and um, being very involved, uh, living in ashrams and taking on an initiation where stitching was actually a meditation, was taught to me as a meditative process with mantras. Um, I showed you the picture of the bag, very intense work. So I was so surprised that like, this was a spiritual creative process, you know, and it was a process that was uh, suitable for me to do in my path. And I took it on immediately and really threw myself into it. And yeah, it was a surprise for me. That was one of the biggest surprises in India. Yeah, that they are craft, there is this craft that is very ancient. It's not a traditional craft. It's a, it's a, it's a spiritual craft, basically, you know. Mm -hmm. And that was wonderful. You look at yourself back before that whole journey started and you see how far you what what you learn and how how you changed right can you predict what's going to happen in the next five years let's say do you have any plan do you have any vision of your future i don't go there I, i'm i'm not a planner i i'm not a what's going to happen in five years you know in in the past 20 years of my life so many incredibly unimaginable things have happened that if 20 years ago somebody had said to me this is going to happen this is going to happen this is going to happen I would have said you're crazy you know I, I don't I have no idea and I, I don't need to know I, I'm not interested quite frankly you know it's like now is where I'm at and um, it, you know it just seems that in these times it's really if we can be that way it's actually a blessing because we don't know you know we I, I also say that, you know, man has this clever mind and that's actually the downfall I see is that we are so clever. We think we know everything right. and I, I'm not interested in knowing everything. So no, I have no idea what's going to happen in five years. Do you have plan as far as like what you're going to need next year? Or is it like whatever inspiration is striking you, that's what you're going to pick up and start knitting? Well, at the moment, I've um, been building up quite a large um, stock of, of shawls for this uh, textile exhibition. So I've got all these, you know, all these shawls and it's kind of like when they sell, when they're sold, when the exhibition's done, I'll see what's left and then I'll decide what's next. Uh, basically, I want to dye up a whole lot more yarn because I've used up all my stash. 
but you know i'm very into i i wear a lot of shawls i love shawls and i love textiles basically you know i've made a lot of garments in my life and i'm really not up for grading i can do it all but it's not what i feel like doing and i love creating textiles because you can you can change your plan in the middle you know, you can, there are many techniques to get extra drape and different shapes and you can wear them. I have people who wear mine like a skirt wrapped around themselves on their heads as a shawl. So I, I feel that particularly in South Africa, it's such a new, you, you can't buy them commercially, you know, people only make them and I think very few people make them. So I do have the tendency to to, to design and create things a little bit ahead of the trend and then stop making them. And then there's the trend. Okay. Um, and so this time I'm, I'm just gonna stick with it. You know, I've decided that that's part of my patience process as well. I'm gonna stick with what I do, what I'm doing. Unless something comes along that just is so fantastic that I have to drop it and, and do something else. Every now and again, I do, I can crochet as well. And I do, funny enough, get this desire in the middle of knitting to make a crocheted something, you know, just to have that crochet um, experience. Okay. And so maybe I'll do a little bit more of that. I'm not sure. But well, yeah. when, you, when you mentioned that you needed Stephen Weston, you told me that you really find him very inspiring as a designer. Do you follow his pattern or do you improvise on his pattern? Oh. I try to follow his pattern. <laughs> I call myself a rebel knitter. You know, I'm a bit of a rebel and I'm a rebel knitter. I, I question, you know, I question everything. Like, why should I be doing this? You know, sure, I think there's an easier way or, you know, I don't like this cast on, I'll change it. And sometimes I'm wrong and I have to frog it and, and go back to what he suggests. But I think I've made enough of his shawls now to, you know, to, I mean, I make, there are about four or five official basic styles that I change up so much that they're hardly recognizable as such. But I must say, um, I was, uh, I, my eyes were really opened when I discovered Stephen West because, I, I mean, in South Africa, I hadn't been, exp you know, exposed to, to, um, to any other creative design. I, I used to knit a lot of things with holes in them on my, you know, before I just discovered designers, I would love to make drop stitches and runs and, you know, stitch and, and do all sorts of crazy things. So when I first discovered, I think the first one of his that I made of the shawls was the speckle and pop, which had those huge holes and a lot of his things have holes. Yeah. So that really got my fancy, you know, so I just add to my repertoire of how to make holes through Stephen West. <laughs> no, I love him. I, I think he is, um, an, uh, I call him a knitting engineer. You know, the way he, he, just man, he, he just maneuvers and manipulates textiles in such an incredible way. No, I, I love his work. I love it. Right. Um, do you have any other designers that inspire you? Quite a few who I, you know, if there's a new something that comes out, I I, I, I follow Jochi, Jochi Lakatelli from Buenos Aires, uh, because I have a knitting friend also in Buenos Aires, and I, I like her style. Um, I can't say that I have any very particular um, designers per se, although I will buy patterns because I would like, for example, the lace border on a shawl. So I will buy that pattern so that I can learn that border and add it onto something else that I'm doing. Even I will add it onto a, a sweater or a hat or something. But um, yeah, I'm, mm, I, I, I don't recall any, I have loads, loads of different ones that I, I follow basically. But right. I would say that, you know, Stephen has got my heart and my hands when it comes to knitting. Right. Well, have you ever considered writing patterns yourself and publishing them? I have. And, you know, I scribble out my notes and things in my notebook. But, you know, I just, first of all, I, I really am not a technology freak. Uh, I'm not very good on technology. And the thought of how to write a pattern, you know, I can write it up by hand, I'm going to type it up, then you've got to get a program, I guess, I have no idea how one does it, and, you know, and, and weigh the wool, and 
you know, give all this information. I'm not really interested in doing that, you know. I, I it's not necessary for me. I, I get more joy out of finding a basic design. In fact, I follow Susan Bryant. I saw your interview with her as well. She has some wonderful videos just on basic shawl shaping. So I follow that and then I just add my own stitches and color to it. So I uh, know I'm, I'm not interested in, in, in doing patterns. No, I'll support my uh, knitting designer community with, with joy. Right. Well, is there another fiber art that you sort of fantasize about trying in the future that you haven't tried yet? Um, hmm. You know, I've tried so many, I've tried many <laughs> that I have not mentioned and I've enjoyed a lot of them. I, part of me would love to learn how to weave, but it would have to be a portable type of weaving. You know, I, the thing that puts me off learning weaving is this huge loom. I've been around a lot of, a lot of weavers and other setup. It's just, it's too time consuming. And then you're sitting in front of this thing and that's where you have to stay. So it fascinates me, it interests me, because I've been exposed to a beautiful, lots of beautiful weaving in India. And um, maybe, yeah, when I'm, you know, when I settle, really settle down somewhere, maybe I would get into that. But I think that is about the only other craft that I would really, and maybe I would like to spin on a wheel sometime, because I know that it's much faster. Right. But again, that means you've got to stay behind the wheel and that's where you sit, you know. I am, um, I, I'm currently visiting my daughter in Cape Town for two weeks, you know, and I, I, I'm a complete nomad traveler. I have my crate with all my wool and my shawls and my suitcase and, you know, that's it. So I, I need to be portable. I, I like to have everything around me. But yeah, weaving is something that maybe I have... Um, once I'm afraid of it, but it feels like a huge job, but um, things that are a huge job, eventually I have to do, you know, I can't have this thing in my mind that, oh, it's a huge job. So I've got to try it. So I guess that's maybe what I will do. Yeah. I don't know. I don't see you settling down anytime soon. And I sort of love that about you, <laughs> the whole unsettledness. Great. I'm glad to see that. <laughs> Because I'm beginning to wonder, you know, I've been here for two years, almost two years now back in South Africa. And wow, it's been a very difficult time for me. You know, I, uh, I'm itching to be on the move. So yeah, I, I guess you're right. I, I'm not settling down anytime soon. <laughs> well, I hope that COVID is gonna ease up on us and that the border is gonna open again and you can start traveling again and going back to places you love and explore new things. Mm. I loved having you on my channel today. Thanks so much, Sita, for being my guest today. Love talking to you. Thanks, Irina. I have to say, I've binge watched all your podcasts. And when I see there's a new one out, I can't wait for it. And I have to say, my absolute favorite is Grant Mayhe. I love, I love him. He is okay. just an amazing character. This show and Grant's, uh, Grant needed it for me and he sent it to me from New Zealand. So I always have it nearby. <laughs> Wow, wonderful. Now, I, I, I look forward to uh, seeing more. And thank you. It's, it's uh, been wonderful being with you. Thank you. And I think you're doing a great job. I'm amazed. You are really very productive. Huh? You put them out there. That's it's great. It's, uh, yeah, it's been a fun year. <laughs> you know, I met a lot of wonderful Good. people. Okay, thank Hold on.